Hey fourth grade, it is a, another beautiful and gorgeous day out at the Wheatley Cafe. And today I have a lesson that I think will be super, super helpful with the, for you when you do poetry. So there are gonna be some poems we come across in fourth grade that are so easy. I mean, like we read it, we understand the literal meaning, we can make inferences, we know what the poet is trying to teach us. And then there are those poems that just throw us off completely and we have no clue what the poet is trying to say. Those are the poems I wanna focus on today. I'm gonna to give you four steps or four tips that you can use now to the end of time to help you extract meaning from those very difficult to read poems. And when I say meaning, I mean some type of knowledge that you can use in your writing and then you can also use later on in life when you think about experiences and how do we interpret the world in which we live in and the text that we read. So hopefully this will be a lesson that you can bookmark and keep for your records because it will be super helpful for you. So no need for me to talk anymore. Let's jump in and get started. I got a shout out and a few announcements. First things first, Jackie and Gavin had impressive written responses to the online work, and it's been really beautiful to watch their paragraphs blossom. Check out some of their answers at the end of this lesson. Furthermore, and this is more along the lines of an announcement, students are not doing well on sometimes a dream needs a push. Please watch the video before you read, and if the reading seems like a lot for you, use the guided reading tool on Common Lit. It will read the passage to you. Or if it's just like too much to read in one sitting, split your time up. Read a few paragraphs and annotate so that you don't forget the focus and the task. Then take a break and then come back later and read the rest of it and annotate. In this way, you're taking small chunks of the text and you're working with it individually instead of trying to read it all at once and forgetting important information. So that's one way you can improve your score if you did not do so well on Sometimes a Dream Needs a Push. You may be asking, Miss Pickens, why do we have to learn how to create meaning from a poem? Can't we just, you know, read it? Well, good readers are able to create meaning from a text by reading closely. Once a reader is able to create meaning, he or she becomes a great reader because the scholar can have conversations about a poem and offer more than one perspective about a poem, if there's evidence. Finding meaning is the greatest gift a reader can unwrap. Our objective for today is the following. Students will be able to interpret the meaning of a poem by analyzing the explicit and implicit parts of the text. Let's deconstruct and break apart our objective so that we can understand it better. The first word that is highlighted is interpret. To interpret is to explain the meaning of. So students will be able to explain the meaning of a poem by analyzing. Analyzing is when you perform a closer reading by breaking apart the text and creating, me creating meaning. One way to analyze is to look at the explicit and implicit parts of the text. The explicit is what the text literally says, while the implicit is when you have to make an inference to add to the meaning. Today we're going to be doing a lot of blending of skills in order to interpret the meaning meaning of the poem. So that means we're going to analyze and we're going to review the explicit and implicit in this particular type of text. For today, I'm going to model how to interpret a poem. There are going to be four steps. The first step is to figure out how many lines, stanzas, and if there's any emphasis in a poem. Step two says to figure out who is the speaker. What do we know about this speaker based off of the word choice that's written in the poem? Step three is to determine the explicit meaning in the poem by annotating line by line. Remember, explicit is what the text literally says. And step four is to determine the implicit meaning of the poem by inferencing and diving deeper. 
Can you make connections among the lines? If you can make connections, then you probably have done a lot of the heavy lifting and will understand the deeper meaning of a poem. Don't forget that explicit mean, meaning is what the text literally says. That's the information directly from the text. And implicit meaning is your background knowledge and your new idea. It's what you must read in between the lines. It's not as obvious. For today's lesson, I'm going to model with the infamous poem, There's a Word. As I go through steps one through four, I want you to take note of what questions I am asking myself when I interpret the meaning of the poem. I'm gonna be diving very, very deep. So in order for you to keep track, you really should be asking yourself, hmm, what is Miss Pickens thinking out loud as she reads this poem and digs deeper into the text? I'm going to use a Google document to annotate because I wanna color code the notes and I can't do that on Common Lit. So while I may be using a different format to annotate today, I still would like you to use the annotation tool on Common Lit. Maybe you can play around with colors or you could just write out if, what step you're doing as you read the poem. On your screen is the poem, There's a Word. Right now, take about 10 seconds, grab your notebook or a piece of paper and a pencil to take notes. All right, step one is fairly simple and it's something we've been doing all year. We're gonna basically break down the poem to figure out how many lines there are, how many stanzas, and if there's any emphasis. Let's start with the stanzas. Take a second and write down how many stanzas do you think there are in this poem? Let's go through and see if your number matches mine. This is stanza one. This is stanza two. This is stanza three. And the last two lines are stanza four, or is stanza four. Now, I want you to take a minute and figure out how many lines are in this poem. I give you a hint, it is more than four. Don't get tripped up by this one. Ready, set, You should have read from the beginning to the end and counted each line individually. Please don't start from one again when you go to the second, second stanza. So it should look like this. The first stanza has four. Then we're going to pick up where we left off. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then last but not least, 13, 14. So there are 14 lines in this poem. Do you see any words or lines or stanzas that have emphasis? Remember emphasis could be lonely lines, um, lines that look very different from the other ones, um, punctuation that's like in your face or any capital letters. This one's tricky, and if you're like Miss Pickens, you will probably think that this last stanza has some type of emphasis. So, why do I believe that the last two lines are emphasized? Well, I think they may be emphasized because they stand alone. There's no other stanza that has just two lines. And I think that may be the case because this is the moral or message of the poem that the poet wants us to take a look at. The poet wants to leave a lasting impression and wants the reader to remember this part. Perhaps these are this is the only stanza with two lines because this is our takeaway. Right when the poem ends, we are supposed to take away this message. Be patient with yourself and begin again. Now let's move on to step two. For steps two, three, and four, I'm going to be on this Google Doc, so please follow along. This is what the format is going to look like. All right, so step two is to think about the speaker, determine who the speaker is, maybe some of their word choice, their point of view. 
Um, so in order for me to eliminate taking a lot of time to do this, we're going to use this key. Every time you see blue and it says speaker, that's where I want us to take a minute and analyze this line to figure out more information about the speaker. So let's look at stanza one, line two. And the apple of my eye. So we know that the speaker is this is poem this poem is from the speaker's perspective. And when they say the apple of my eye, that means that the speaker has someone that they adore in their life. So usually you may not know what the apple of my eye means. This is like an idiom. It's like any time we're saying, it's like any time someone is really special to you, they're the apple of your eye. They're the center of your attention, right? So this is something where um, background knowledge and inferencing is important. You would need to know that phrase beforehand. So this is almost like a mashup of step two, which is determine the speaker, and step four, which is figure out what things are implied. So this is an implied meaning or an inference. Okay, so let's say, I saw its head emerge. Again, the speaker is speaking from their point of view. They're talking about this person being the center of their world. And there's a worm in the middle of their the, the apple. And then she sees the worm's head emerge. So the speaker is seeing the worm come out from the center of the apple. Let's look down here where it says that monster within, right? So this should be within, that monster within. Look at the word that the speaker is choosing. The speaker chooses the word monster. This is a moment where you're gonna go, hmm, how is Miss Pickens thinking? When I hear the word monster, I wanna think, does this have a good connotation or a bad connotation? And when I say connotation, I mean reputation. So when we hear the word monster, do we have positive thoughts or negative thoughts? And if you have similar experiences that I have, then you will know that this is considered a negative thing. So she chooses the word, the speaker chooses the word monster, meaning that the worm is now negative and scary, whatever that may mean. It's 100 shifting feet. So again, the speaker is noticing things about this worm turned monster. All right. Um, she says, begins the rot and soon the rot's complete. And again, I don't know if this is a woman as a poet or a man as a poet, so I should be using both pronouns. But here is another observation where the speaker notices changes in the apple of her eye because of this monster-like, can't type today, worm all right my love when comes the inborn urge to eat so again the speaker now is speaking directly to the person she adores he or she adores and then eventually you'll eat right through your skin so now the speaker is giving advice and here's the kicker, wisdom, right? Usually when you have someone who's, you know, older than you, they say something, my grandpa used to do this, he used to talk in riddles, and I'd be like, what is he trying to say? And it's like, if he didn't care about me, he wouldn't have said anything to begin with, right? So people who are wise sometimes don't always say things just um, overtly, like there's always some type of hidden meaning behind it, almost like a poem. So that's what the speaker is doing. And then last but not least, here the speaker again is giving advice. All right, so we just went through for step two and we tried to locate every time the speaker said something like a command or gave some type of advice. 
Now that I've gone over step one and step two, I want to move into steps three and four. However, unlike step two where I annotated for the speaker in the entire poem, I'm only going to work on stanzas two and three for steps three and four. I would very much like you to go back into this poem and apply all four steps to all four stanzas for homework as you're reading this poem. Step three says to determine what the explicit meaning of the text or the poem is. To best do this, you should break up the poem or the stanza by each line and think to yourself, what is this line telling me? What is it literally saying? There are two things you probably need to do to figure out explicit meaning. The first is to grab a dictionary for words you don't know. And the second one is to really start thinking literal. So whatever you read, read it with a purpose. And that purpose is to understand what the poet is saying literally in that line. So let's start breaking apart. The first line says, the monster with. The speaker chooses the word monster to represent this negative, scary worm. Explicitly, what this literally tells us is that the monster is the worm and it has something conjoined to it, something that's forming onto it that we're going to read in the next line. The next line is, it's hundred shifting feet. The speaker notices things about this worm turned monster, but what is it explicitly saying about the hundred shifting feet? Well, we know that the monster-like worm has, I'm taking the word 100 and I'm literally writing 100 feet that moves a lot because shift means to move. Begins the rot and soon the rot's complete. I'm going to conjoin these two because the lines are pretty small. Um, and let's see what it literally says about these things. Well, the monster-like worm rots the apple. It's very simple. Um, it starts the rotting process so that the apple is completely decayed or is completely dead. So this is how we do step three for stanza two. Let's move in to see step three for stanza three. My love when comes the inborn urge to eat. Here's a moment where you may want to grab a dictionary to look up inborn or urge. Inborn is something that is natural, something that you naturally do. And to urge, have an urge means to have a real strong want to do something. So if we break this down, what the poet is saying is that the person that the speaker adores, um, when it comes time to eat, never eat yourself up from within. Literally, what is this saying? Don't eat yourself from the inside out. Eventually, you'll eat right through your skin. Think about it. If you're eating from yourself from the inside out, what's the last bite you're going to take? Well, that's going to be your skin, your epidermis, right? So if you do, then you'll eventually end up eating your skin. Your entire self will be gone. We just went in and we took a look at step three for two stanzas. Now I'm gonna go back to stanza two and we're gonna do the implied meaning. Step three, or sorry, step four. So <clears throat> if we're talking about the monster with these um, feet that are conjoined to it, right? Let's start thinking about what this may mean, what this may represent. <clears throat> So for the first stanza, <clears throat> this darkness or doubt or shame is within the person that the speaker adores. Because remember, the monster in the apple is going to be um, a symbol for this self-doubt, this shame, this darkness, or this sadness. <clears throat> so then what about the hundred shifting feet? Well, this dark side is constantly coming and going like a shadow within the person that the speaker adores. It's forever moving, right? When things are really irritated, sometimes you may do this, like if you become really anxious, you may pace a room, you may move back and forth, back and forth and try to figure things out. That's the same with this monster. 
we just use some of our background knowledge about what people do when they are overwhelmed with the pacing moving back and forth and we apply it to this text by making connections between the lines so that's how we do an, an, um, an inference when we say implicit meaning and then last but not least begins the rot and soon the rot's complete the worm or this darkness starts to slowly rot the person that the speaker loves because remember these are all metaphors the apple is a metaphor for the person that the speaker adores and then the monster like worm is a metaphor for self-doubt so the self-doubt starts to slowly rot away at the person so the speaker doesn't even recognize this person anymore or the person's beauty think about an apple what happens if an insect keeps feeding on an apple eventually the apple is going to disappear it's going to be gone so this person is losing itself to this dark um, self-doubt that's the inference and for that we took an image in our head and we thought about it well what happens when an apple is rotted from the inside out oh it completely decays it disappears you don't recognize it anymore it doesn't look like an apple apply that now to the metaphor let's try this for stanza three when it comes the inborn urge to eat so now this is where it gets really heavy what happens when you naturally want to eat something why do we eat food to begin with these are the questions i'm going to ask myself so i can dig deeper so i know we eat food because we need nutrients we need energy so when we eat something and it goes through our body our body has to digest it which means pick apart the food to take the things that we really need how can i apply this to this monster like worm well when it comes time to internalize or to digest to meditate we sometimes like beat ourselves up or we're really critical of ourselves and what we say or what we do when we feel this guilt this sadness comes so just like it's natural for us to want to eat food it's natural for us to doubt ourselves and then make ourselves feel bad for some of the mistakes we've made or for some of the things we cannot necessarily accomplish there this is like another heavy metaphor to compare eating with self-doubt this idea of eating like rotting yourself from within with these negative thoughts but never eat yourself up from within so even when these things happen what is the poet trying to say about eating yourself from within and now the poet is talking to us directly right because where she's using he or she is using the word you so they're referring to the speaker don't allow that monster or that dark side to completely take over. When you say within, within is all of the things that are within your body, your organs, your heart, your soul, your spirit. So the poet is saying like, don't allow that monster to completely take over all the things that make you you. Eventually you'll eat right through your skin. Well, boys and girls, what happens when you're if something is eating from your inside out, what is there left? What do you notice about yourself if you're being eating from the inside out? Eventually that shame, that guilt, or that sadness will eat all of who you are and no one will recognize you. It's like you never even existed. The person that um, the speaker knew from the beginning that was so beautiful and deserved adoration will no longer be recognizable to anyone. So. What the poet is saying is, do not allow your self-doubt to make you not even recognize who you are anymore. Keep true to yourself. For the last part of step four, you want to put together all of this knowledge and a nice little summary of what the poem is about. If you don't do this, you may get lost with all the little details and it may be hard for you to synthesize what it, the main idea is and its important details. So let's do that quickly. The speaker is telling us that we need to be patient with ourselves because or whenever we begin to doubt or be critical of ourselves because if we are not kind to our own selves then eventually we will no longer recognize how special and unique we are to the world this uniqueness is what makes us adorable or worth adoration or worth beauty and it makes others want to adore and appreciate us so this is my 
overall main idea for this poem and I got this by breaking down line by line figuring out what this who the speaker is what the speaker is saying that's the explicit and then applying some of my real world experience and some of my background knowledge about these emotions that the poet is conveying for um, step four which is the implicit meaning so once I combine steps one two three and four I'm able to put it all together and synthesize my poem. For homework, I want you to do this for the first two stanzas and the last stanza because I did this for stanza two and three for you. Now that I've modeled steps one through four for you with very difficult or challenging poems, I want you to try one on your own. You're gonna pick a challenging poem on Common Lit, or if you feel more comfortable on News ELA, Be My Guest, you may use that platform. And I want you to complete the steps for extra credit. I may load a Google document onto Clever where you can go in and write down. Um, <laughs> if you guys find any explicit, implicit meaning to a poem. See how I have to talk in between. Sophie yelling at the neighbor. Now that Snoopy is done screaming at everyone on the block, let's try again. Now that I've gone over steps one through four for you, I want you to try this on your own. You are going to go on to Common Lit, or if you feel more comfortable on News ELA, be my guest. And I want you to pick a challenging poem and complete the steps for extra credit. I may put a Google Doc on Clever that you can have access to and write your answers on. So try your best to do this. For homework, use these four steps to help you with the activity lesson on There's a Worm. This is gonna be a very challenging poem regardless if we went over it together just now or not. So let me take a minute and dive a little deeper into the guided questions that you're going to see for homework. The first question you're gonna see looks like this. It asks which sentence describes the theme of the poem. Remember that the theme is a universal message that can be applied to anyone. It is a moral or something that you can take with you as you continue to live your life. So, knowing that, if you look at the options below, and as you do your homework, I highly recommend that you write down what you think the theme of the poem is going to be. I'm asking that you write this down in your notebook because the theme is going to come back up in your open-ended question, and if you have no idea what a good theme would be, here's an opportunity for you to pick one out of these four. That way you can find answers that best support it as you read the poem. The third question will say, which of the following describes what the worm will most likely represent in the poem? For this, I want you to remember our notes on what the worm could possibly represent. We went over that today when I did my annotations. Also, take a minute to think about the first question on theme to help guide your thinking. Last but not least, you're going to get an open-ended that looks like this. How do the final two stanzas contribute to the poem's theme? This open-ended question is asking you to focus on the last two stanzas only. Find examples from those last two stanzas that help support what you think the theme is. When you answer question one, which I went over with you like five seconds ago, like I said before, make sure you write down what you think the right answer of what the theme is so that you can find examples of it while you read the rest of the poem. Remember, boys and girls, you have to write at least a paragraph, and a paragraph is five to seven sentences. If you submit a two-word answer or a two-sentence answer, it will get a score of an automatic zero. I'm pushing you to be thinking like a fifth grader and less like a third grader. 
Before you head outside for a hike or jump online to play a video game or take a brain break and watch one of the videos I posted, I want you to check out some great written responses for inspiration. These two examples come from Gavin on two of his articles that he did over the Memorial Break weekend. Take a minute and read them to yourselves so that you can figure out what a great written paragraph looks like. Furthermore, Dartmouth did not disappoint. Here are two responses written from Jackie. She did a beautiful job adding some information from the text and great evidence and examples. Take a minute and read through it and see if there's something that you can do to help better your paragraphs when you answer your questions for homework. Welcome back. So I hope that this lesson on poetry was really helpful for you. I had to walk outside and get a breather from Snoopy because he was driving me insane. Um, but hopefully what I did teach you, you could hear at least some of it. Thanks a lot, Snoop. Use these skills whenever you come across a really challenging poem and I swear it'll make things just a tad bit easier, if not alleviate all of the pain that comes with reading challenging poems. I hope this was helpful and I cannot wait to see what you guys produce for homework. I love you and I'll see you soon. Bye.